We are greatly honored to have James Grant with us today um, to present the Henry Hazlitt Memorial Lecture, which is sponsored by James Rodney. The title of this lecture is, fittingly enough, Hazlitt, My Hero. Actually, all you need to know about Jim is that he writes with the clarity and economic insight of Henry Hazlitt. But there's much more to tell. Uh, Jim Grant is a financial journalist and historian and the founder and editor of Grant's Interest Rate Observer, a twice-monthly journal of the investment markets. Among other books, he is the author of five books on finance and financial history, including Money of the Mind, uh, The Trouble with Prosperity, and Mr. Market Miscalculates. That was written in 2008, okay, and I, I think you know the point of that. Um, his a John Adams' Party of One, a biography of the second president of the United States, was published in 2005. Um, forthcoming uh, in, in the fall is the, uh, the Depression That Cured Itself, the last laissez-faire depression, 1920-1921. This uh, I, I eagerly await this this book because this is a great unknown depression um, that the Keynesians will never tell you about, or if they do, they'll lie about it. Um, Mr. Grant's television appearances include 60 Minutes, The Charlie Rose Show, CBS Evening News, and a 10-year stint on Wall Street Week. His journalism has appeared in a variety of periodicals, including Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, Foreign Affairs. Um, Mr. Grant is a former Navy gunner's mate. You're not packing now, are you? Uh, and, and the Phi Beta Kappa alumnus of Indiana University. He earned a master's degree in international relations from Columbia University and began his career in journalism in 1972 at the Baltimore Sun. He joined the staff of Barron's Magazine in 1975, where he re originated the Current Yield column. I might mention that... Um, Jim Grant was in line for the Fed chairmanship had Ron Paul won the election. <laughs> um, so without, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Jim Grant. Spontaneous photo. <laughs> Very candid. <laughs> Well, I thank you, Joe. I thank you, James Rodney. Um, you know, I stand before you uh, lit by the luster of the great name Hazlitt. Uh, you know exactly how honored I'd feel if uh, you were a science reporter who had been asked to deliver the Einstein lecture, or if uh, you were a baseball writer who had been summoned to speak at Cooperstown. It is a privilege and a pleasure to be here. Um, financial journalism, of which Hazlitt was the non pariah mid 20th century American practitioner, is an especially ephemeral branch of a famously per perishable trade. Not only, generally, is it not for the ages, uh, the proliferation of uh, texts and tweets and Instagrams has made it uh, increasingly not even for the next hour. Believe me when I tell you that when you stand at the pinnacle of financial journalism, you are standing at sea level. <laughs> <laughs> now there have been giants. Uh, Walter Badgett, the Victorian polymath, uh, he was the second editor of The Economist, uh, having married the daughter of the first editor of The Economist. <laughs> Uh, Badgett was one, uh, a great man of letters uh, as well as a great journalist. Uh, William Peter Hamilton, who edited the Wall Street Journal about the time that it hired Henry Hazlitt in the 19-teens, uh, certainly was a formidable character. Um, and standing head and shoulders over most practitioners in the uh, mid-20th century was my mentor at Barron's, Robert M. Blyberg, who um, stood for the things that Hazlitt stood for, and uh, also John Chamberlain, who should be mentioned in the same breath. Um, my plan today is to uh, uh, deal with uh, Mr. Hazlitt and his legacy in three parts. I want to tell you who he was, and I would like to tell you a little bit about the, the signal cyclical event that he lived through, 1920 and 21. And then I want to touch on the relevance of his ideas today. But I want to frame the discussion about uh, finance um, uh, with a, 
little sidelight on, uh, on compound interest. This is at the heart of, of investment markets. Now, I want someone here, um, uh, perhaps one of you students who has a, either a very good internal calculus or a calculator or a computer uh, to double check me. I'm going to do these numbers in my head. Uh, this, is, this is to set the scene. Uh, I'm going to describe for you what might have been if the human race were only a little bit more adept with money. All right? Okay. Now, Cleopatra died in the year 30 BC. I say this on the authority of Wikipedia. <laughs> 30 AD. No, 30, 30 BC is what they say. And uh, uh, let us say that uh, uh, one of her loyal uh, servants had the presence of mind uh, to liquidate $100 worth of her bangles and make a perpetual deposit at 2% interest in the Bank of Eternity in Alexandria. Um, okay, someone, some, I'm not going to deputize anyone in particular, but I want you to, okay, so 2%, that's uh, 30 BC, to, to, I'll call it to 2044 years, right? At 2% per annum. Let's see, carry the three. <laughs> yes, that would be five, uh, uh, 37 uh, comma 909 That's the sum of money that would be uh, available to we human, us human beings. Now, it's a, that's an awkward sum. That's before tax. So let us reduce this to something <laughs> <laughs> before tax and depredations. Uh, let us reduce it to a little more manageable, say, per capita. Uh, that would be $5.3 billion per capita, which, as the former middleweight champion Jake LaMotta used to say, is a lot of money even when you say it fast. <laughs> uh, perhaps you have read uh, uh, the somewhat downcasting news that fully 36% of Americans nearing retirement age have saved $1,000 or less. Now, I put it to you, ladies and gentlemen, the difference between $5.3 billion per capita in the world and less than $1,000 is the measure of the difficulty we have buying low, selling high, and keeping our hands off other people's money. <laughs> All right, that's by way of... Let us now return to the subject at hand, Henry Hazlitt, who had to deal with the same foibles, uh, the same human... Uh, uh, propensity for error with respect to money that we do to this very day. So Hazlitt was born, I think, in 1894 in the second administration of Grover Cleveland, a most propitious political woman. It was Cleveland who said, uh, the government, the people should support the government, but the government should not support the people. Now, I know at the Mises Institute, uh, they agree with the second part of that. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, Henry Hazlitt was born. Uh, the year was 1894. The city was Philadelphia. Um, he and his family moved at length to New York. He grew up in New York in somewhat straightened circumstances. He went to go to Harvard, um, got on the wait list at Auburn, and said to heck with it, he was not going to go to college at all. No. But he did not go to college. Um, he's, uh, he said, something having to do with a shortage of funds precluded me. So he was an autodidact. He taught himself, uh, except for a couple of semesters at uh, City College, he taught himself what he knew, and he set out to be a philosopher. And he, uh, he published his first book as a teenager. He was uh, certainly a prodigy. Um, and then he did what so many accomplished and good-looking people have done since then. He set his sights on a career in financial journalism. Uh, so having published Thinking as a Science at the age of 22, this is 1916, he got a job in the Wall Street Journal. He had to support his mother. And uh, he thought that journalism would help him do that. That was his, his first miscalculation. But he persisted. Uh, from the Wall Street Journal, he went to the New York Evening Post. That was Alexander Hamilton's paper. Hamilton had by then retired. <laughs> and not long after joining the New York Evening Post, he uh, went to work writing a monthly financial letter for something called the Mechanics and Met Metals National Bank in New York. Now, if you haven't heard of the bank, it's because it never took TARP money in 2008. <laughs> well, that gig lasted not much longer than others. Hazlitt seems to have been rather a job hopper. Um, but he came as this uh, bank 
economists have a proper disdain for financial prophecy. Uh, he got this at a young age. It's taken me 40 years in the business to understand that no one can know the future. I can't imagine where I'd be today if I understood it at the age that Hazlitt did, but uh, he did understand it. He said, quote, too many factors must be known and no one can know them. Now, in those few short words is a great deal of truth. Um, uh, so he persisted with the New York press. He got a job in the New York Sun. He was a commentator and he was a literary editor. He became a literary editor at The Nation. This shows uh, uh, Hazlitt's uh, uh, great, uh, uh, his, the breadth of his talent. Uh, a little like Walter Badgett, the eminent Victorian, uh, Hazlitt uh, could write about criticism and culture as well as about finance. And uh, uh, none other than H.L. Mencken, for whom Hazlitt presently went to work, declared that Hazlitt was, uh, was rare if not unique in that he was a cultural critic who almost alone among the human beings who have ever been known to, to Mencken could actually write well. And it was indeed to Hazlitt that Mencken turned in 1933 to take over the editorship of the American Mercury. Um, uh, presently, again, Hazlitt moved on. He went to the New York Times in 1934 and he began to write editorials. Now, Paul Krugman was not then on the staff. <laughs> and the Times uh, lined up uh, uh, very much in the uh, Misen uh, kind of uh, Lou Rockwell wing of American thought. Well, not quite Lou, uh, but it was more in that direction than in the direction for which it's known today. And, um, and, uh, uh, and Hazlitt continued writing editorials at the time until 1946, and he wrote some wonderful editorials um, examining, analyzing, condemning uh, the arrangements set up in 1944 and 45 to govern the world's monetary affairs after the close of the Second World War. The World Bank and the IMF were those arrangements, and they came within his gun sights, and he let them have it. Um, uh, 1946, he makes his last career move going to Newsweek magazine, where for the next about 20 years, he writes a, a column called Business Tides uh, until the mid-1960s when Newsweek decided that uh, it had to get with it, and it hired Milton Friedman. Um, uh, so what was it about Hazlitt that, uh, that, uh, that sets him apart? Well, first and foremost um, is the wonderful organization of his mind. Uh, he set out propositions in a way that were instantly um, uh, clear to a lay reader. He wrote a book called uh, Economics in One Lesson in 1946 that uh, sold about 700,000 copies before the publishers ran out of stock. They would. Uh, it was translated into many, many languages uh, and uh, it I can only imagine how bad things would be today if he had not written it. <laughs> um, uh, uh, there's something that, uh, that uh, my man, my hero, Hazlitt, must answer for. And I think it's better to make a clean breast of these things rather than pretend they never happened. Um, Hazlitt got a letter from Paul Samuelson. And... Uh, the letter said this, he said, uh, a writer never knows what his impacts have been. I can say that, no, that one of the reasons I decided to go into economics was reading your article about economic argument. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, if God can forgive Henry Hazlitt for this, so can we. <laughs> Uh, and and, and uh, Hazlitt answered to Paul Samuelson very graciously indeed. He said, uh, uh, oh, he said, uh, you know, uh, it is so gratifying to get this letter. He said, uh, you know, in my book uh, uh, on the new economics, which Hazlitt demolished, he said, uh, uh, we seem to disagree on some things. In fact, I may have been uncivil in some of my treatment, but I, and you can see that the older man was immensely flattered and gratified by the attention of the younger one, the then eminent and younger one. 
Um, what else did Hayek, well, did, did my man Hazlitt do? Well, for one thing, he, he brought to the attention of the American public the contributions of the great Austrians of the mid 20th century. It was Hazlitt's review of, of uh, Road to Serfdom uh, that set uh, Hayek's uh, wonderful uh, book in uh, commercial motion in 1944. And do you know the New York Times Book Review played that on page one? It was thanks to Hazlitt's agitation that it was not buried on page 33. Uh, Hazlitt was similarly responsible for um, bringing the attention of the Yale University Press to Mises's great tract on socialism. Um, one of the remarkable features of Henry Hazlitt's life to me is, is how he moved in in the intellectual circles of his day. He was not marginalized as some sort of right wing, wing nut. Uh, at one point, he was the chief editor of the American Scholar. At one point, he was, his, his work was reviewed in, of all things, the American Economic Review. This was at a time when economists didn't only talk to themselves and only speak in garlands of algebra, uh, to be sure. But nonetheless, his, his work, Economics One Lesson, among other things, got the serious attention of serious scholars. Uh, he was in correspondence with economists of all stripes. Uh, he lived the life of the public intellectual uh, without sacrificing any of the truly eccentric for his time, eccentric beliefs that he held so dear. Um, I want to favor you with a couple of passages from Hazlitt's work just to give you a sense, and only a sense, or a taste of the delight um, that his readers enjoyed in reading him hot off the press. Here he's talking about um, uh, flight capital. This was a big thing. Uh, well, it's a big thing today, too. Uh, but flight capital, I think this, this piece dates from the 1940s. Um, and uh, here is Henry Hazlitt writing in The American Scholar, the journal for the Phi Beta Kappa Institute, uh, writing on this somewhat uh, uh, wonky subject of flight capital. He says, uh, the politicians in power and economic writers who reflect their point of view seek to put the blame not on the government that has made its credit and intentions questionable, but on the creditors who question them. They call the money of these creditors hot money, though it is, of course, merely money that is trying to leave hot places. <laughs> and, uh, and here is the great Hazlitt um, on trade. He was uh, now um, dueling with Max Lerner, um, not one of Murray Rothbard's favorite journalists. <laughs> uh, he was dueling with Max Lerner on the subject of economic planning. Ah, yes, planning. Now there's an evergreen. Um, and the connection specifically has, was dealing with free trade and planning. Um, uh, just what the planners mean by free trade in this connection, I'm not sure, but we can be sure of some of the things they do not mean. They do not mean the freedom of ordinary people to buy and sell, lend and borrow at whatever prices or rates they like and wherever they find it most profitable to do so. They do not mean the freedom of the plain citizen to raise as much of a given crop as he wishes or to come and go at will, to settle where he pleases, to take his capital and other belongings with him. They mean, I suspect, the freedom of bureaucrats to settle those matters for him. And they tell him that if he docilely obeys the bureaucrats, he will be rewarded by a rise in his living standards. But if the planners succeed in tying, trying, uh, sorry, tying up the idea of international cooperation with the idea of increased state domination and control over economic life, the international controls of the future seem only too likely to follow the pattern of the past, in which case the plain man's living standards will decline with his liberties. Um, uh, this is a remarkable production. It's a remarkable production for its clarity, not a hair on the head of this pro Zeta place. And it's remarkable, not least, for the courage uh, with which Hazlitt advanced these ideas. Uh, he was writing in a high time of, of socialist thought. He was writing at a time the world was, uh, uh, was organized for warfare. And of course, that means that the state was up in the saddle and digging in its spurs. Uh, and as I say, Hazlitt managed to uh, to be the most forcible champion of enterprise and of liberty, while at the same time 
not giving in to the bitterness of the isolated individual waging some sort of supposedly futile war against the authorities. Uh, you might look up if you can. In fact, one of the wonders of the age, of course, is the World Wide Web in which the entire canon of human pornography and misinformation and information <laughs> is available. And you can, if you go back to your college campus and go on uh, ProQuest, which allows you digital access to, or access to the digital archives of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, look up a review of Hayek's, of uh, Albert J. Knox's book in 1935, Our Enemy the State. Now, uh, this is a, is a, Knox was a most curious McTavish. He was a devotee of the ideas of Henry George. What Knox seemed to want was the state to seize the land and take for itself the economic rent that land yields and thereafter to leave us all alone. How the seizure might go, we never really find out. Uh, but Nock advanced this very, very, to me, eccentric strand of anarcho-libertarianism in this book, Our Enemy of the State. It was a fine indictment of the New Deal and its works with the backdrop of Henry George and that project of seizing the land. So Hazlitt uh, uh, rather gives the book the back of his hand, uh, uh, only inviting the author to think a little more clearly about what he's about. And then, too, he takes Knox to task for Knox's peculiar brand of, of doomsday fatalism. It will never get better, nor should we try to make it so, because it cannot. You know, come on. Got to try, right? So anyway, this is, so this is Hazlitt um, uh, taking on an intellectual challenger from supposedly his side. Um, anyway, that's my hero, Henry Hazlitt. Uh, uh, naturally, the author of a forthcoming, forthcoming book wants to ram that title into the conversation. So I'm going to tell you a little something about the Depression of 1920 and 21, because it, uh, among other things, was the first formative cyclical downturn through which Henry Hazlitt lived. Uh, he was a cub reporter, as to, I guess by that time a rising journeyman reporter, and he lived through this. What was this? Well, um, uh, uh, let me say that, uh, uh, that enough bad things happened uh, so that if they had happened today, uh, we would have truly QE forever. Um, I'm going to give you a, um, a profile of the difficulties uh, that America faced in the uh, Depression that, according to the National Bureau, began in January of 1920. Now, the backstory to this depression was an inflation, and the backstory to the inflation was the Great War. As you know, World War I ended in 1918, and as you may not recall, uh, uh, people braced themselves at the end of the war for what had been a customary wartime depression, or post-war depression. Uh, such had been the case in America after the War of 1812, had been the case in Britain after the end of the Nepal Napoleon... Uh, <laughs> I was going to say Judge, Judge Napolitano Wars. <laughs> uh, he is a terrific speaker. Um, after the Napoleonic Wars, uh, such had been the case in America after the Civil War. Surely, surely, uh, there would be a depression in 1918-1919. Instead, uh, there was uh, just a glorious, a glorious inflationary boom. Um, it carried so far that almost everyone came to believe it would persist. That's the sign of a good boom, when you know it will go on forever. Uh, and adjusting their affairs to the uh, the certain prolongation of this boom. Uh, you know, General Motors built uh, the biggest office building in the world and outside Detroit. I think it's still standing. It's now government property. No, it's not. <laughs> the government's given it back. Um, uh, oh, yes, uh, two entrepreneurs out in uh, Kansas City, uh, fellows named Truman and Jacobson, opened up a haberdashery. Um, uh, farmers uh, bought uh, mechanized plows and tractors, and uh, uh, the country was on fire with enterprise and with easy money. And then, as all things do, and especially as all inflationary things do, this boom 
came to an end. It went boom. And what followed was a perpendicular decline in just about everything. Um, never before, nor since, have commodity prices fallen so sharply as they did in 1920, starting about the springtime. Uh, before too many months were out, the wholesale price index of the time had fallen almost by half. Um, as measured, and no doubt mismeasured, uh, by the Commerce Department subsequently, the nation's output um, suffered a decline of almost 24% in nominal terms, 8.7% in real terms. Um, industrial production down 31.6%, stock prices down almost by half, peak to trough, and corporate profits down by 92%, 92%. Uh, unemployment, you ask? Well, uh, Contemporary measurements put it at between 2 million and 6 million. That was the state of knowledge of unemployment. Have you heard of uh, uh, the great Hong Kong colonial administrator, Sir John Copperthwaite? He was the, uh, uh, the eccentric who, in the late 60s and early 70s in Hong Kong, uh, insisted that no surveys be conducted to calculate so-called macroeconomic variables, lest those data be put to use for the wrong purposes. Well, this was a Sir John Capperthwaite kind of slump, because no one knew nothing. Uh, the macro had really not been invented. I have been through uh, almost every scholarly journal of the time, economic scholarly journal, and have found exactly no mention of the macroeconomy, or of, still less of macroeconomic potentialities for intervention. Uh, so uh, unemployment was severe or not severe, depending upon the locale in which uh, you talk to people. But the high end of the 6 million person estimate that would imply a jobless rate of about 30-odd uh, percent, I think that was way too high, but still it was severe. So the adage that the past is a foreign country is nowhere more apt than in economic history. But still, qualitatively, one has a sense that things were all wrong and, and very, very worrying. Um, I say this, I say this because uh, there have been a lot of scholarly attempts subsequent to that depression to, uh, to, to paint it as a kind of a bump in the cyclical road. Uh, Christina Romer, who's a very fine economic historian, contends that uh, based upon her reconstruction of the data, uh, it was nothing more than uh, than, than especially irksome, but not frightening recession, as I would characterize it, a bump in the road. However, what Christina Romer doesn't know is that I have surfaced clinching, if not quite econometric evidence, to prove her wrong. Now, I'm going to tell you, but you can't tell anybody else until the book comes out. <laughs> in 1921, there appeared a hit song called Ain't We Got Fun. Now, if I could sing, I'd sing it. As it is, I will recite a few of the lyrics. Every morning, every evening, ain't we got fun? Not much money, oh, but honey, ain't we got fun, etc. Now then, ladies and gentlemen, I put it to you. Do they write songs about recessions? I thought so. This is a depression. Um, <laughs> well, the, did not Mises teach us that uh, we cannot pretend to be overly quantitative in our analysis. Okay, so what does the government do? This is, this is uh, mass area, right? A pandemic of economic difficulty. What does the government do? Well, the government had been used to doing rather a lot. Uh, we'd just been through the First World War. Woodrow Wilson um, uh, was certainly not averse to government intervention and uh, had been heard to talk, uh, talk about how in the post-war world, socialism was a thing. But Woodrow Wilson suffered a stroke, and uh, his administration was as incapacitated as he was as the cyclical tide turned in 1920. So what the government did approximately was nothing. Um, uh, the Treasury... Uh, under the management of people who thought the budget should be balanced, uh, the Treasury balanced the budget. A small surplus, actually. Ah, yes, the Federal Reserve was, uh, was uh, 
not quite out of short pants. It had been founded in 1914, and it was uh, now in the trial run of its first big downturn. How do you suppose it met these sorrows of 1920? Of course, it raised interest rates. Uh, this is the only cyclical episode in American history in which money market interest rates, nominal money market interest rates, were higher at the cyclical trough, the depths, than they had been at the cyclical peak. Um, at the worst of it, in 1921, um, real money market rates of interest were probably on the order of 15 or 20 percent, punishing, constricting, asphyxiating real rates of interest. I want to address now a, a question to Paul Krugman. I know he's watching. Dr. Krugman, given the barbarity of this public policy response to our troubles to 1920, 21, why did the Depression ever end? Ah, silence. I thought so. <laughs> Well, if you read Alan Meltzer's history of the Federal Reserve, he will talk about the real balances effect. And I, you know, I can't understand economists when they speak English. I think what he means is that the value of money increased as the price level declined. I think that's what he means. So that money in one's pocket or one's bank account bought more. Uh, and because money was more valuable, um, uh, people could uh, see bargains and seize them. Um, uh, prices fell, I mentioned that. I did not mention, but this is equally important, wages were allowed to fall. Wages fell too, sometimes 10, 15, sometimes 20 percent. Wage declines were not so deep as price declines, but the fact that wages were allowed to fall and did fall allowed business firms to readjust and to restore their profitability at lower levels of product prices. Um, the consequence of all this, of course, was that the Depression did end. But before it ended, I want to tell you, especially you investors in the audience, how things looked at the bottom. Um, uh, you know, uh, in this day and age, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, takes it upon itself to save us uh, from the worst of the consequences of our collective errors. And it intervenes before things come to uh, such a pass as we on Wall Street know them to be value-laden. Um, uh, the Fed did not uh, choose to do this in 1921, and here is how things looked at the low point of the stock market in August. Uh, many stocks then uh, translated into multiples of 1923 earnings, forward earnings, of less than five times. The steel companies uh, of course, cyclicals, they would be selling that cheap, but also the kind of consumer products companies that had enjoyed a relatively prosperous depression. Has anyone here heard of the Coca-Cola company? I understand it's based in Atlanta. It was then new, um, uh, but it was a comer. People could see that. Uh, there were only 500,000 shares outstanding, a small company. Stock market capitalization, all of nine and one half million dollars. But it was valued at what would prove to be 1.7 times the next year's earnings, and two and a half times 1923 earnings, and the shares paid a dividend yield of five and a quarter percent. That is called a bargain. Uh, Gillette Safety Razor Company, selling as many razors and blades in 1921, that worst of the Depression year, as it had in 1920, was quoted at a little bit more than five times forward earnings and yielded nine, nine and a quarter percent. Radio Corporation of America, not yet revealed as one of the great growth stories of the 1920s, could be purchased in the market for about as much as it earned in 1923. It was trading at one times 1923 earnings. So it was a depression. But ladies and gentlemen, it ended uh, owing to the resiliency of uninhibited markets. Um, Murray Rothbard, the great Murray Rothbard, uh, said that uh, in his way, you know, without qualification, he said that, uh, um, I know he said this, he said this, that the only way, the only way 
to treat a depression is through laissez-faire? Well, I don't know. But let me just say this, that the, the lessons of 1920-21 as I read them, and the lessons of 1929-33 as I read them, having read Murray Rothbard, certainly did not disprove this most audacious and most unqualified assertion. Uh, Herbert Hoover, the Secretary of Commerce in 1921 under President Harding, was champing at the bit to do something. Uh, Hoover was, in fact, a great humanitarian, but as it turned out, the great humanitarian's attempt in 1929, 30, and 31 to institute a wage freeze was an act not of humanitarianism, but of unintended cruelty. Uh, so anyway, so this was the first formative cyclical event in the journalistic career of the young and rising Henry Hazlitt. Um, next up, I want to I try to uh, relate some of Hazlitt's uh, commanding ideas uh, uh, to the present day, to our difficulties and opportunities today in finance. And um, uh, uh, the first of his ideas um, is that inflation is something more than a rise in the CPI. Um, Hazlitt was uh, a perennial uh, worrier about inflation. It irked his editors at Newsweek no end, but he wouldn't stop. Um, and he was at it uh, in 1946 as he was at it in 1966. And, um, you know, I, I, I proceed on this question of inflation. Um, I think one ought to define terms. And, and to me, inflation is not uh, too much money chasing too few goods, but too much money. The thing that the redundancy of money chases is variable. Um, could be uh, things at the checkout counter, could be things on Wall Street, could be office buildings in Park Avenue, it could be farmland in Iowa. You don't know, but uh, uh, in the past year, uh, central banks have materialized net $1.9 trillion. $1.9 trillion, that is net of a substantial reduction in the balance sheet of the European Central Bank. $1.9 trillion. That's more than the GDP of India. Now, one hears constantly that this money is, is benign. It is harmless. It is, it is merely helping us adjust to the new normal, which phrase, if I hear one more time, even if I say it, I will scream. Um, uh, Hazlitt knew that uh, uh, that redundant money and credit makes mischief, the nature of which mischief is variable. So here, listen, if you would, please, to Henry Hazlitt in June of 1946, declaiming against the government, which uh, was talking then, as it has recently, about deflation. And before I quote Hazlitt, perhaps I should try to define deflation, at least for my satisfaction. To me, deflation is not a decline in the level of prices, if that decline can, in fact, be measured properly. Um, uh, say we live, one lived in a time of great material and technological progress. Just for instance, say one lived in an age of robotics and of digital wonders and of the ubiquity of information, uh, true, false, and otherwise. Say if one did. End of globalization, as they say, and of the division of labor perfected through digital technology. If one lived in such an age, might one not expect the cost of producing things to fall? And if one did, might one not expect the cost of buying things to decline? And if one expected those things, would one choose to call that deflation, or might one choose to call it progress? Yeah. Now, the Federal Reserve seems not to notice that most Americans spend most weekends looking for deflation. <laughs> they seem not to mind it. Uh, so to me, at least, there ought to be deflation. Right? There ought to be what they call deflation. There is progress. There ought to be deflation. No, there can't be because the central bankers wish to raise up the level of prices, which can't be measured. They wish to raise up the level of prices by 2% a year, plus or minus. Um, 
By so doing, say I, uh, uh, the central banks, with every good intention, managed to create such an increment of redundant money and credit as to do mischief. Um, now, this mischief sometimes is, is, is most, most welcome. On Wall Street, we call it a bull market. Uh, so this deflation business is, is very complex, but I think in its essence is rather simple. So enough preface. Let us hear Henry Hazlitt in 1946 on inflation and deflation. Quote, a Washington correspondent of the Wall Street Journal reports that the government economic experts, experts, are now convinced that deflation, which Hazlitt used in sneer quotes, deflation, and not inflation will be the big problem six months to a year from now. Planners of federal financial policy make no secret of their belief that the danger of post-war inflation was passed in late spring, and that from now on, a greater danger lies in too rapid deflation. This was the year, mind you, in which the Employment Act was passed, the famous Employment Act of 1946. Such a belief on the part of the government planners in Washington would not be surprising. The whole economic philosophy they have adopted leads them to believe at almost any period that the real danger is deflation. Those words in quotation marks, the real danger is deflation, whatever the evidence may be on the other side. So this is Hazlitt, 1946. That was 67 years ago. And he might have written it yesterday. Uh, one hears, one heard from Ben Bernanke, a deflation. Um, almost kneeling before Milton Friedman in 2002 or three, Milton, Anna, Anna Schwartz. We did it, he's speaking on behalf of the Federal Reserve. We did it, we won't do it again. What is he talking about? <laughs> Milton, we're against progress. We're going to fight it. <laughs> anyway, that's Hazlitt on deflation. So that's, that is one important strain of Hazlitt's lifetime, uh, lifetime writing that uh, bears a direct and immediate, uh, has a direct immediate and immediate bearing today on our financial lives and our portfolios. A second is the question of interest rates. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have devoted 31 years of my adult life to writing about interest rates, and I got to tell you, I cannot see them anymore. They're tiny. <laughs> now, I. <laughs> I mean, no one's getting any younger. I need interest rates now. <laughs> um, but the present era is not the first in American, modern American history in which interest rates were, you know, uh, you know little people, midgets. Um, in 1946 as well, uh, the Fed... Uh, had been enlisted in the cause of public finance and wartime finance and had kept rates at, uh, at uh, sensibly zero. A long bond was 2.5% or something. They, they, they had uh, nationalized the yield curve then. Yield curve meaning the alignment of interest rates over time. Three months, two years, five years, 10 years. That's a yield curve. Um, then as now, uh, the Fed was, uh, had its thumb on the scales of finance. Uh, here is Hazlitt writing on the, the headline of the piece is the fetish, the fetish of low interest rates. And this too is from 1946, from July of 1946. And again, um, I wish I had written this last week. In fact, I may write it next week. <laughs> All right, quote, when interest rates are kept arbitrarily low by government policy, the effect must be inflationary. In the first place, interest rates cannot be kept artificially low except by inflation. The real or natural rate of interest, that's Newt Wicksell talking, not bad for a newspaper guy. The natural rate of interest is the rate that would be established if the supply and demand for real capital were in equilibrium. The actual money interest rate can only be kept below the natural rate by pumping new money and new credit into the economic system. This new money and new credit add to the apparent supply of new capital, just as the judicious addition of water may increase the apparent supply of real milk. Oh, isn't that lovely? 
but the money rate of interest can be kept below the real rate of interest only as long as the supply of new money exceeds the supply, the, the, uh, 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 supply of new real capital. And he winds it this way. Excessively low interest rates are inflationary in the second place because they give an excessive stimulation to the volume of borrowing. Well, now we come to the year 2014. Um, uh, interest rates, uh, the federal funds rate, which is the, fe the rate the Federal Reserve directly influences, has been at zero for well nigh six years. Six years. That's the date, late length of our emergency. Uh, now, uh, there is uh, a doctrine in finance called the dividend discount model. And uh, as you chartered financial analysts know, uh, the price of a common stock is the present value of its future cash flows discounted to the present by a suitable rate of interest. Future cash flows discounted in value to the present by a suitable rate of interest. Now, what would happen to the calculation of the value of that stock if the rate of interest were unsuitable, if it were artificial? Well, Hazlitt, actually, now that you mention it, <laughs> says this, excessively low interest rates are inflationary because they mean that bonds, stocks, real estate, and unincorporated businesses are capitalized at excessively high rates and will fall in value even though the annual income they pay remains the same if interest rates rise. Well, this is March 2014. Uh, uh, Janet Yellen, who was the ruler of America, <laughs> it's kind of bossy of her, isn't it? <laughs> I pull a Larry Summers. Janet Yellen is the ruler of America in that, insofar as the Federal Reserve controls such interest rates as people in markets use to discount the present value of earning assets. Um, this is very, very explosive business. If our interest rates are artificially low, it follows that our values are artificially high. It follows further that we live in a kind of a valuation hall of mirrors. We don't exactly know what things are. We don't exactly know where things ought to be. Uh, we can imagine where rates might be if they were left to find their own level. You know, one wants natural interest rates, you know, free range, organic, sustainable, local. <laughs> But instead, we have kind of hothouse interest rates. You know tomatoes in February? Those are the kind of interest rates we got. Hothouse interest rates. Uh, so you know, what we at Grants are in the business of trying to do is to, is to, is to divine value. We, you know, I, I went to India last week to check out what values might lurk there. We, look, we case the, the credit markets and the equity markets for things that are mispriced. And it's never easy, but it is made all the more difficult uh, by the uh, Federal Reserve's intrusion into this most basic element of the valuation equation, that is, this simple rate of interest. Um, in conclusion, I wish to thank once again uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hazlitt for having given us this remarkable man, as well as uh, the Mises Institute for putting on this lecture for the sponsor of the lecture and for you for being here. Uh, what a remarkable man was Hazlitt and how well it would suit us all uh, to live more closely to his example.